So Champions Innovate is is um, a program aimed at uh, creating a legacy around the organization of the Champions League final. So in this program, what we've done is since we the core focus is very much on the city that hosts the Champions League final, we have a partnership with the uh, office of the Mayor of London and told them, we went to see them maybe a year ago and tell, told them basically we're, we're interested in uh, leveraging the Champions League final host city as a testing ground for solutions that can create value for the city of London in the context of the event, but also elsewhere in Europe. This is the Sports Tech All-Stars podcast, showcasing outstanding startups and initiatives in the global sports tech ecosystem. From Sports Tech X, the leading source for data and insights about sports tech. Here is your host, Ron Mahotra. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sports Tech All-Stars podcast. We are full in full swing in April leading up to our next ecosystem report, where we will showcase all the latest, coolest initiatives in the sports tech ecosystem, whether it's in it, investors, innovation hubs, accelerator programs, what are the good actors doing that will support startups uh, in sports tech to achieve their goals and help grow the entire sports tech ecosystem. One such important actor is, of course, UEFA, and I have from them their Innovation Hub Manager, Charles Fremont, who is uh, on the show with us. Welcome to the show, Charles. Hi, Ron. Pleasure to be here. And a pleasure to have you, Charles. Uh, We know each other for a while from, let's say, the previous profile before you joined UEFA. We've had some good times at various events, so glad glad to get you in front of the camera and to do this together. Very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And I promise I won't mention any of the good times we've had, Ron. I think that Oof. could be a bit detrimental to both our reputations there. Sure. <laughs> I, feel, I feel I feel like there was a bit of a leverage over there. Maybe we, uh, we'll keep that conversation aside now, but all, all in good fun. As always, we've, we've seen each other on the circuit at various conferences over the years. And yeah, it's always a pleasure to catch up with, with old friends. All right, Charles, before we get to the... Uh, UFI Innovation Hub, and especially the Champions Innovate program, which I want to hear more about from you. I also want, uh, I think our listeners like to hear a bit more about the person uh, before we get to the initiative. So walk me through quickly your journey that took you to UFI and this super interesting role as the Innovation Hub Manager. Yeah, um, well, my let's say my journey was not uh, the, the one I had planned, but I'm very, very happy in, in my role now at UEFA. Uh, the reason why I say that is I was I have a, an academic uh, background in law. Uh, so I did law school in Canada. I'm from Montreal, uh, from the French speaking part of Canada, uh, lived there most of my life and then um studied as a lawyer, was a lawyer for a couple of years, working in um, a Canadian multinational company, uh, mostly focusing my my profession on commercial law. Um, But I was always a massive uh, sports fan. And what I wanted, and I was always fascinated by uh, big sport events. And so um, I decided um, back in 2014 to enroll in the FIFA Master. So it's a master sponsored by FIFA, focused on sports uh, management and sports law. Um, so I did that in 2014, 2015, and then um, evolved uh, from the law sector to go more in a consulting role um, inside a, a company based out of Lausanne in Switzerland for two years. Um, and the mission of the company was really to bridge the gap between the international sports world and the public sector worldwide. So I did work on uh, many uh bids uh, for major sports events such as the LA 28. Well, it was LA 24 at the time, if you remember, for the the Summer Olympics. Um, So I worked on that, did a couple of uh, projects with the United World Wrestling Federation, worked with the city of Lausanne on their Olympic capital bid. uh, Sorry, not bid, but brand. Um, And then, uh, so I I did a lot of projects around that for two years, but that was not necessarily related to tech or innovation at all. Um, after two years, uh, I wanted to, to move to Paris for uh, personal reasons and uh, then managed to um, 
apply to a role in a sports tech startup accelerator named Le Tremplin. Um, it was the first sports tech accelerator to be uh, created in Europe at the time. We were in 2015. And then it was created by the city of Paris, actually, to um, make sure that a part of the Olympic legacy for Paris 2024 uh, was to be focused on innovation and empowering young and promising French companies um, to, uh, to, to make sure we could leverage their technologies on uh, in the context of the Paris 2024 Summer Olympics. And so I joined them in 2017 um, as responsible uh, for the mentoring programs. And then when uh, the former director, who was my boss at the time, left, he actually has a similar role to mine, but at Paris 2024 uh, organizing committee. Uh, his name is Omar Al Zayat. So if he's listening, salut Omar. Um, and um, so, so yeah, so so we, I took over his role uh, when when he left for Paris 2024, and then. Worked there for about two years and a half, three years in this role, uh, mostly focused. So in my first role in the accelerator, I was very focused on mentoring the startups. And in the latter role, I was mostly focused on um, creating and building these uh, open innovation partnerships with institutions uh, from the French sports ecosystems, but also from corporate organizations. So we were working with the French Ministry of Sport, with the City of Paris, with the French Olympic Committee, but as well with uh, Decathlon, um, Nike France, uh, PwC. We were working with the French insurance company, really to kind of uh, work on their innovation culture and making sure we could actually create opportunities for some of the startups who were mentoring with the likes of, of such organizations. And, and that is actually when we met, I remember for the first time, and I think it was maybe 2018 or 19, yep. that we came to one of the La Trempla events and uh, <clears throat> let's say got a couple of uh, post-event beers. And that was a good, <laughs> I remember we were on a boat somewhere on the River Seine, was it? We were on a uh, boat on the River Seine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, great times. So, and that is when, around that time, when you transition into this role at the UFN Innovation Hub. So also to point out that I guess you, we could call you some sort of OG of the sports tech space, I've been around it, in and around it for a while. So now walk me through what the Innovation Hub is about, what your role that you took over, and then lead us into, let's say, the Champions Innovate program. Yeah, for sure. So I joined UEFA in the summer of 2021. Um, so that was right in the middle of Euro 2020, uh, which was postponed for reasons that we all know about. Um, and so uh, the Innovation Hub had been created in 2018, um, so so three years before I joined. Um, it had gotten quite a, a good, a fair amount of success, um, especially by making creating awareness on the fact that UEFA was open to envision collaborations with startups. And so it started with uh, my predecessor, Jean-Baptiste Alliot, who actually um, launched a, um, a startup challenge in 2018 uh, to focus on seven areas in which UEFA was um, looking to innovate. And so seven, of, seven startups were actually uh, accompanied. And out of these seven startups, actually six ended up uh, signing, um, you know, partnerships with UEFA um, and became either a supplier or a service provider in, in our various uh, activities. Um, so that and then, you know, there were other startups that were also that went through our, our acceleration program um, in the lead up to, to COVID pretty much when the former team of the, the, the Innovation Hub actually left for, uh, for, for personal reasons, uh, each on their side. And so when I joined, I kind of had the task to um, build up on what had been initiated, but to also see which opportunities were, um, you know, were, were already identified at the time and were not necessarily leveraged. So we could write the next chapter for the Innovation Hub. And this is when we... Uh, my team and I, we, we started to focus a little bit more on what does innovation mean for the organization? Because there was kind of a reputation internally that the Innovation Hub was there to actually source startups. And this is what it was, <laughs> but it, 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 it was a bit larger than that um, in the mind of, of Jean-Baptiste. And, and, and I wanted to make sure that we could 
materialize some initiatives that would allow us to really work on the culture of innovation at UEFA. Um, and so this is when we started to speak more and more as innovation as a way um, to tackle complex strategic problems that we face as an organization or as an ecosystem, the European football ecosystem, through new tools, methods, um, and processes that we could leverage. And so our, in a nutshell, what this means is the role of my team is to empower every employee within UEFA or every organization within European football to make sure they have the tools to reflect as an entrepreneur on specific uh, problems. And how do we materialize that? We have three different spectrum of, of, of activities. So the first one is we, um, we work internally uh, in partnership with internal divisions um, to support them in envisioning what's the future of their respective responsibilities. The second bit is uh, the second pillar of activities are the innovation programs that we are structuring on uh, in the context of our uh, competition. So we have a first program that we've designed and created and are about to finalize for this season on the Champions League. It's called Champions Innovate. Um, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak a little bit more in details uh, about that in, in the next few minutes. And we are creating a second program now on uh, in the context of the Women's Euro in Switzerland in 2025 to um, tackle some challenges in the growth of women football across Europe, but focusing on uh, Switzerland as a testing ground and leveraging the Swiss innovation institutions to really help find solutions to those challenges. And then the third pillar of activity that we have just started to, to actually uh, roll out is uh, facilitating a knowledge sharing uh, community of a, of a few football stakeholders in Europe. So namely uh, national associations, the 55 that are members of UEFA um, clubs. So we work hand in hand with uh, the European Club Association to actually see how we can foster more knowledge sharing on innovation projects within this group of stakeholder, and finally the leagues. And so right now we have about 25 organizations that are part of this community. And the idea is really to shed light on who's doing what and how are they doing it. And to also leverage this group to diffuse innovation frameworks that they can then replicate. So I guess the, the red thread in, in all of these three pillars is very em much about empowering people, whether they're colleagues of UEFA internally or external football or commercial stakeholders into um, innovating in a structured way. And we support them by providing them the, the tools, but also providing them the right connections with the various innovation stakeholders. Thanks for that, Charles. I think you did a really good job of setting the context, <clears throat> let's say the breadth of all the work that the Innovation Hub does. First is all the internal stuff. So identifying how can UEFA be better at what or understand its own needs better, future-proofing the organization in some way. Second is to run the programs, which are external-facing, which we'll come to in a second, as you said. And the third is the interesting one, which I didn't know so much about. It's almost like being um, uh, sharing best practices between the, between the member associations and stuff, which is also super cool. Happy to chat about that as well. But for now, let's focus on the second pillar, which mm -hmm. is the external-facing program. Yeah. So you've got Champions Innovate. What exactly is it and how does it function for this year? It, that's a, a good question. Um, so, so Champions Innovate is, is um, a program aimed at uh, creating a legacy around the organization of the Champions League final. Um, so, so it is a legacy that can be applied and leveraged, obviously, in the city where the final is located, namely London for this season. Uh, on June 1st, we'll have the final at Wembley Stadium. Um, but also a legacy that can be scaled across European football on a specific theme. Um, that being said, we, we really believe that at the core of what we do at the Innovation Hub, we we, we promote collaboration between a diverse set of stakeholders because we really believe that the most impactful innovation projects are carried out 
with the support of, very, uh, of a variety of stakeholders. So in this program, what we've done is since we the core focus is very much on the city that hosts the Champions League final, we, we, we have a partnership with the uh, office of the mayor of London um, and told them, we went to see them maybe a year ago and tell, told them, Basically, we're, we're interested in uh, leveraging the Champions League final host city as a testing ground for solutions that can create value for the city of London in the context of the event, but also elsewhere in Europe. And so... We, Sorry, we, that's interesting. So you went to the city of London. This yeah. is a UEFA-led initiative where you try to rope in the city as a partner. Exactly, exactly. Because cool. obviously in the traditional model um, under which UEFA organizes its its uh, club competition finals, our main stakeholder is uh, the national association, the country where we're going. So in this case, it would be the English FA. So obviously the English FA is very much tied to the operational organization together with UEFA of the final itself. But then the city is also a, a very important stakeholder. And so uh, this, this kind of program was designed uh, by, by my team, but also in partnership with our colleagues from the host city relations team within UEFA, as well as the uh, sponsorship team. So I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just a little second. So we actually um, went to see together with my colleague uh, Walid from, from the host city relations uh, department of UEFA to seek a, a, a meeting with the, the main advisors of the mayor of London. And they were all very excited to collaborate with us on that because they felt, okay, like this is an opportunity for to make sure that the final is not only about the 90 minutes that happen on the pitch at Wembley. It's much broader than that. And it's a way for us to kind of bring the city in the context of the final. And so what we, we told them is when we launch an innovation program, we need to understand what is a challenge that we're trying to solve. And so here they said, um, basically, London is a world-renowned city to host major sport events on a yearly basis. So we want to see how we can enhance the social and environmental impact of the final through innovation. And so that was a, it's a very broad topic. So what we did then is we went to see our commercial partners on the Champions League through our sponsorship department within UEFA um, with my colleague uh, Kai McMahon. And so we actually pitched an opportunity to each of the sponsors to get on board with this program and told them, listen, with the City of London, we're willing to organize an innovation program around enhancing the social and environmental impact of the final is there a specific sub challenge that we could design with you and we would then seek the uh, a potential collaboration with a startup to actually create a solution on that sub challenge and so we have three sponsors who decided to get on board for this first season um, so the first one is uh, pepsico um, so pepsico is, is a massive uh, company with with several brands so we, we focus with Rockstar, their energy drink uh, brand on this program. And so Rockstar uh, sponsors uh, a, um, a, a, an activation in the fan zone that will take place on the Friday night before the final. So the final is on June 1st. So that will be on May 31st. Um, it is a DJ show. And so what they wanted was to make sure that the energy that were a substantial part of the energy that is required for the DJ set is powered through green energy and powered by fans, ideally. So this is how we kind of defined the challenge. And then we communicated that challenge. It was last autumn uh, between September and November. And we actually uh, sourced a UK-based startup called PaveGen. They create these kinetic tiles that when you walk on them, they generate energy. Um, and so I cannot disclose too much of what the project will be about uh, on PaveGen, but it's how do we leverage these kinetic tiles in the context of the Friday Night DJ show uh, powered by Rockstar. Um, so th that's a surprise for people attending the final or who will be attending that event? Uh, not only the final, it will be attending that event, which will be in the Champions Festival at Trafalgar Square. So um, stay tuned for more information on that on uh, on, on our platforms. Um, so that is the first challenge. The second mm -hmm. challenge is uh, with Just Eat Takeaway. Um, so Just Eat um, wanted to see how we can bring 
uh, more awareness to fans on the carbon emissions linked to their food consumption choices around the final. And so this is kind of the challenge that we, we created. And we found another London-based startup. It, it's a, actually a, a competition that was open to worldwide startups, but it just happened that the three companies we sourced were from the UK, which is obviously a very innovative country. So, uh, But it, it's just a matter of a coincidence. And so, I'm sure the uh, mayor of London didn't mind that either. <laughs> of course. But actually, that was one of the... Um, just if I put this in parenthesis in the explanation of the challenges, the mayor of London's office saw it as an opportunity to also reach out um, to companies that are based outside of the UK right. and, 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 and ha- through their um, economic development agency called London and Partners, who are a key stakeholder in this program, they saw it as a good opportunity to uh, have more awareness on what are the cool startups out there that they didn't really have under their radar. So many of the startups that applied that were not selected are actually now in contact with London and partners to see how they can potentially open a London-based office. So, so this is also part of the, the legacy of the program, if I may say. Um, so on Just Eat Takeaway, we actually found a uh, London-based startup also called My Emissions. And what they do is they do carbon labeling of food items. And so a little bit like uh, the Nutri-Score that we see more and more on packaging of food, uh, mm-hmm. it's A, B, C, D, or E. That is obviously the Nutri-Score linked to um, the, the health and nutritious aspect of the food itself. Uh, but what my emissions has created is another score, A, B, C, D, or E, that shows the carbon impact of the food itself that you're consuming. And so what we're assessing at the moment is um, actually uh, putting these new, the, this my emission score in the food and beverage stands within Wembley Stadium. Wow. As well uh, <clears throat> as uh, in uh, the food trucks that will be located in the fan zone, and see. Uh, so what we're we're trying to experiment here is shedding light on the carbon emissions linked to each item on the menu. If this will drive more um, a more conscious choice by the fans, and so 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 this is uh, this is the the project with Just Eat. And also by the supplier, I would imagine, like when they, I mean, they don't want to have too many foods on their menu where the, the emission score is E, for example, right? They would probably be a bit more conscious of, of what they offer. And the last one, MasterCard, la- I believe, right? The last one is, is with MasterCard. Um, so MasterCard, they wanted to really leverage the global fan base of 3.5 billion fans of the Champions League and see how we can actually engage these fans into uh, making themselves more uh, sustainable behaviors or actually pledging to make more sustainable behaviors. And we actually found a, uh, it's not a startup, actually, it's a charity uh, based out of the UK as well um, called Pledge Ball. And what they're creating is a, um, is, is, is kind of a competition between fans of the teams of the clubs that are remaining in the Champions League uh, final as of the, the, the round of 60, the quarterfinals, sorry. And so what they're doing is you can register as a fan on this platform and say, uh, I am a fan, for example, of Bayern Munich. And there is then a list of recommendation of sustainable behaviors or sustainable actions you can take as a fan. And so I pledge that I will be, for example, using a reusable water bottle from now on. Um, and so what they're doing now is, is actually assessing how many pledges are made by fans associated to each club and kind of running a, kind of a knockout stage of the Champions League and say, OK, like in for example, the quarterfinals between PSG and FC Barcelona this season, um, who are the fans that are pledging to the most actions in terms of their sustainable behavior? So it's kind of creating this this competition between the clubs and seeing which club will actually get to the top. Um, uh, And and so in a way to really uh, make the fans uh, commit to sustainable behaviors. Is there a measurement of that pledge as well? Yeah, so so basically the it's it's uh, the whole the whole methodology is is academic based based out of a research paper made out of the University of Loughborough in the UK, and so what they're doing obviously it's impossible to actually evaluate mm-hmm. each of the fans that will sign up to this if they actually 
uh, walk the talk on their pledges. Um, but but there is a methodology uh, looking into you know some samples, and so we can actually take away some some major. Um, uh, you know, so, some major uh, insights as to how many fans uh, did it on a sample base basis, a little bit like polling. Um, so, so these are the three programs uh, we're looking at for, for this year. Uh, we are going to, so we're already well advanced in the development and implementation of each of these pilots. We're already in testing mode on some of these projects. And so um, most of these will be actually showcased, well, all of the results actually of these pilots will be uh, showcased at an event that we're hosting at London City Hall on May 30th. So it's an invite-only event. Um, so it's not open to the public, but we will do a lot of communications on the UEFA uh, platforms on the results of this, not only on May 30th um, at London City Hall, but also in the weeks after the Champions League final, because a lot of these solutions will actually be implemented either at Wembley Stadium during the final itself or um, in the Champions Festival uh, in the city. Um, so, so basically, we will be uh, creating some video capsules showing the journey of each of these companies right. in, for the program, but also a, a longer form explaining what have been the results of this and what have we learned. And then for the experimentations that will be successful, obviously for us, the idea is to learn from this success or for the ones who have not had the success that we were hoping for to learn from what has happened and then being able to diffuse this knowledge uh, throughout European football. Um, and so that's that's kind of the idea of Champions Innovate. It's very much about a collaboration between UEFA, the host city of the final or commercial partners, and a startup to really drive a concrete or, or deliver a concrete pilot that can be tested around the organization of the final. What I appreciate is how specific the challenges are as well. Like there is a very clear goal and then you want to find the right partner and then frame the goal in the right way that makes sense for, for everyone. What would you say to, I guess, through the application process, just walk me through that quickly if you can, that yeah. I would imagine that there were a lot of startups that would be a straightaway fit, but a lot of others that are maybe not so relevant to these challenges, but but they might be interesting for the future. How would you... How do you address those startups that are not always a good fit for the challenge that you're running at the time? That's a very good question. So, so on the application process itself, uh, we decided to shift a little bit the way we did things before and also to, um, to, to, to actually look into more specific sourcing. So obviously we did a, a big communication campaign around it, but we, we have a software supplier called PitchTape, actually, with this is our application platform. And what we have is what we're asking companies to do to apply to the program is obviously they can submit a deck, a slide deck, but what we're asking them is to record a video of about four to five minutes on the website directly. So you cannot upload your just commercial video. You actually need to answer a few questions and there's a proper timing associated to each question to, to help us at UEFA, but also with the commercial partners and the city of London to really see first, what is the value that you can create as part of the program? How do you envision the collaboration? Meaning, what do you expect from UEFA, from the commercial partners and from the city of London in this context in order to develop the pilot? And the third bit is, how do you intend to work with us? Um, and that is very, very, these are three questions that are highly important for us to be aware of when we actually assess a collaboration with a startup, whether it's on Champions Innovate or any other opportunity. And so, so the fact that the founders needed to record a video was creating a lot of value for us. And what we actually noticed is it also uh, naturally decreased the amount of application that we got right. compared to others. But the I, I think we got close to 100 applicants on the three challenges, which is already quite a lot because in the end, we, we only sourced three companies. Um, but they were all very relevant to the challenges themselves. And, and so we learned a lot from, from these videos. And actually, there are some companies that we're still in contact with that had applied to the challenge, were not selected. But we felt they could create value for either other areas of UEFA 
or potentially some other stakeholders that are mobilized, for example, in the innovation community that we are structuring in, around the uh, European football stakeholders. So, so it's it's never lost to reply to these challenges because we do <laughs> look at all of the videos, look at all the decks, and when you know the challenges are s- defined with such a clear focus, then it it just drives more focused applicants as well. Yeah, it's easier to take action. It's quality over quantity is the is the let's say cliche line, but very applicable in this instance. And also, a message to the startups is: if this is not your challenge, maybe just get in touch anyway and send us a detailed piece of information about how you can perhaps assist UEFA and what value you can create. And maybe down the line, it'll be keep in mind. But most of all, make sure you stay up to date with all the information that's on the website and and what UEFA is looking for. At exactly. a particular at a particular moment, and, um, and if I may, Ron, uh, if I may just add on to what mm-hmm. you said, basically the the pitch tape solution. So basically, the, our application platform, we are in the in in the midst of a revamp of, of the whole UEFA.com website, but also on the uh, innovation hub page. So we will have a uh, permanent uh, portal where startups from any kind can actually. Uh, pitch in their ideas to UEFA, but it will be in the same format that I just explained. Right. They'll need to record a video. And I think, as you just mentioned, it's very, very important for, for us to understand what is the value that the solution can create for UEFA, what have been the use cases, and how do you envision to collaborate with UEFA? If you are not able to explain that, then it's it's a bit of a loss of time on, on both ends. And also, I mean, that's something that a startup has to be able to do. I mean, we're not asking for elevator pitches. It's not a 30 second or one minute uh, situation. You're actually giving them a bit of time to establish a strong use case. All right, Charles, we've absolutely motored through uh, our time. So I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about what's coming up. So there is the Champions Innovate, which will happen at the Champions League final, the final showcase. The startups have already been selected, but maybe there is something else coming up. You also already mentioned the uh, Women's Euros, um, is this Champions Innovate likely to come back for future Champions League finals, for example? Anything around that that you can shed shed some light on? Yeah, sure. Um, so Champions Innovate, we're in discussion right now with the city of Munich um, uh, to, to reconduct it for next season. So obviously Munich uh, will be hosting uh, the Champions League final in 2025. Um, so it's a program that has created a lot of value this year already. We, mm-hmm. we we see a lot of enthusiasm from our commercial partners and from the, the City of London, the Greater London uh, Authority. Um, so we are in discussion now with uh, with Munich for next year. Um, we should be able to confirm that, hopefully, uh, knock on wood, in the coming weeks. Um, so again, stay tuned for that on the Innovation Hub page on UEFA.com. Uh, if it is reconducted and we launch a new application process, it will be on a different theme uh, than the social and environmental enhancement of the final. Um, that's what we're assessing with the city right now, uh, as well as our commercial partners. But this will be uh, published most probably in September of 2024. Um, then we also have the Women's Euro Innovation Program that I spoke about. Um, so this one will less tackle startups, but mostly the Swiss innovation institutions in uh, finding solutions to um, you know, uh, some challenges that we face in the growth of participation in uh, women and girls football. Um, and so, so that will be in a similar format to Champions Innovate in the sense that we will be working with commercial partners on this challenge, as well as the Swiss innovation institutions, as I mentioned. And uh, we also are very grateful for the support of the Swiss uh, Football Association as well. So uh, my team and I were in Bern um, last week to, to actually define some of the challenges with them to make sure they're relevant in a Swiss context. Um, so that will be uh, launched in the coming weeks and months as well in the lead up to the Women's Euro in uh, in the summer of 2025. Um, so these are the two major programs that we have in mind. But again, we're continuing the work on this community to really create this knowledge sharing platform between um, clubs, national associations and leagues um, of Europe and, and, and making sure that they can learn from each other. But also when we identify some challenges that are relevant to most of them, then we may launch some specific challenges 
on these topics. And that will obviously be communicated on the Innovation Hub page on UEFA.com. And we'll look out for that. I can't let you go before asking about a certain summer tournament that is not taking place in 25, but in 24, right uh, out here in my neck of the woods. Uh, anything that we can expect uh, around the Euros here in Germany? Yeah, well, the Euros um, will be one of our most innovative events, uh, for sure. We're, we're not organizing a proper innovation program uh, okay. like we're doing on the Champions League. Uh, but but we have innovated in a few ways, especially on the sustainability aspect of the, of the event. Um, it's the first time, actually, well, the Euro will be taking part in Germany. And so there are some clusters that have been identified of matches, ensuring that uh, during the group stage, uh, the teams that uh, you know the three matches that they will play in the group stage will actually be organized in similar areas of Germany to make sure that the fans can actually travel in a more sustainable way. Uh, there is a huge partnership with the Deutsche Bahn also uh, making sure that the fans who have tickets for the events can benefit uh, from from uh, from very interesting prices uh, on the train and also during uh, the event. So in the I think it's like a day, uh, the day of the, the 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 match that they have a tickets for. Um, they can actually use public transportation for free in the city where yeah. the match is actually staged. So there are many ways that uh, the event will be will be uh, will be innovative around that. You know, incorporating these new concepts of organization to ensure we can diminish uh, the carbon footprint. But also on the fan activation side, I cannot disclose too much, but there will be really cool experiences for fans. Um, whether it's on a digital standpoint or uh, on a physical standpoint in Germany. So I invite everyone to to, to be connected to our uh, UEFA Euro 2024 platforms and to also visit uh, Germany if you have an opportunity to do so, to experience all of this. Yeah, I look forward to experiencing it firsthand. I've got tickets for a couple of games, always on the hunt for more wherever they pop up. So yeah, it should be a good Euros. Um, Charles, just to finish up, what is the best way to reach out to you if there's a startup listening or a potential partner? How do you get in touch with the UEFA Innovation Hub? You already mentioned that on the new website, there yeah. is an application portal for the startups to yeah. get in touch. Yeah. Um, is there any other, let's say, good way to reach out via email or LinkedIn or something? I think right now we're we're under construction of this new page, so mm -hmm. so it it's not live yet. The best way to actually reach out is to send an email to innovation at uefa.ch. That is a very simple email address. Obviously, we get a lot of solicitations. I'm not going to lie. So please be as detailed as possible on what is the value you intend to create for UEFA, how do you envision the collaboration, and what is it that you are expecting from us. And then uh, we are reviewing everything. Uh, but in a capacity format, we're only replying, obviously, to the solicitations that we believe can create value. Um, so, so obviously, uh, please bear with us on that. Um, and then uh, in the coming months, yes, we will have this new portal uh, live. We hope it will be before the beginning of the summer. Uh, so around the launch of the Euros, um, mid-June. So, so Super. please do know that. Yeah, we will drop the email in the show notes. Um, yeah, I did. Seems like you're looking for details, so I'm sure the startups or partners will provide it uh, as long as there is somebody reading all that detail. So, yeah, best make best there be time for that. Charles, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Before I let you go, I have a last question to ask. It is my favorite one to do. I always believe we are sports fans first, so I want to know what has been your favorite sporting moment. Ah. Uh. Um, I'm going to have to do go with something different yeah. than football. Uh, so, so obviously coming from Canada, my sport I, I is I thought ice that's where we might go. And I had a good feeling. I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, yeah. I think the biggest sporting emotion I experienced, and I'm sure if there are any Canadian listeners, they can relate to that, is Sidney Crosby's golden goal in the final of the 2010 Vancouver Olympic, uh, where Can in which Canada won gold medal in ice hockey against the U.S. Uh, it was such a stressful match. It was 2-0 for Canada up to three minutes before the end of regular time. The U.S. tied within the last three minutes, and then we scored golden wow. goal in overtime, and it was... Uh, 
beautiful moment. See, and that's why yes. I like to ask the question because obviously it brings a smile to the face of my guests straight away and also gives me, <laughs> I haven't seen that game. I don't watch a lot of ice hockey, but I will be sure to go to YouTube and check out the highlights. So thank you for that, uh, Charles. And thank you once again for taking the time to talk to us about the UEFA Innovation Hub, all the cool work that you are doing and also everything that is coming up. Uh, yeah, in case there are... Uh, more experiences and you need people to test stuff on ground in London or in Berlin at the final of all these major events that are taking place, please let me know. I'll be happy to happy to make the time to help you out, shall we say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ron. <laughs> Always appreciate it, Charles. That is a wrap for another episode. We have a few more lined up. A lot of big organizations are running big innovation challenges uh, in sports tech now and we'll have more coming your way soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Sports Tech All-Stars podcast with Roan Maholtra. If you like our show, let us know and leave a review. And if you want to know more about us, check out SportsTechX.com, where you can find our latest industry reports and updates. For a deeper dive into all things Sports Tech, check out our comprehensive database, SportsTechDB, at SportsTechDB.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find us at Sports Tech X on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Join us next time for another insightful conversation with a leader in sports tech.